Good afternoon, everyone. We're real thrilled to be here. And this is among our very favorite topics, hence why we're all working in the business of the new world, the new horizons. Thank you for joining us. Um, we want to get right to it. They're going to each person is going to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about the work that they're doing on the New Horizons. And then we are going to have a brief conversation and then open it up to questions, because we know that um, this is a, an extraordinary gathering of people who are looking at this notion of gaming and interactivity and three-dimensional worlds and experiences in a lot of different ways. And so we really look forward to hearing some of the questions that you have here. And obviously, we could talk about these things for hours, if not days. So I'm just going to let the panel take it away and uh, introduce themselves. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Svetlana Dragaeva, and I'm the CEO of the Fountain Digital Labs. It's a London-based technology company. And we create uh, digital projects for children and adults. And we currently have two projects, Viri and Viri VR. And the first in the series of Viri VR is Viri VR, Feel the Wild. And maybe to better introduce it, we could just watch a short video. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Viri VR consists of three types of content, uh, interactive um, experiences, non-interactive relaxation experiences, and also live streaming cameras. And um, it's, it's all about your interactive virtual safari trip where you meet and encounter different wild animals, you interact with them. So you are in a very positive emotional situation, but you also learn a lot about conservation issues and their problems. and. And, 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 you, and later, you are being asked to also help if you want to participate in real life help, to put it shortly. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. But you're working on a number of things. This was just one of them. Did yes, you want to tell us a little bit about what the macro view of your venture <laughs> is about? You want to give passion? us a sentence or two on that? In general, we, we're trying to combine two big tracks. The track number one is. Um, emotional detox that we're trying to deliver to you through technological nature. And this is based on the research that non observation of non-threatening nature stabilizes your emotional balance, and then you are more um, capable of solving high cognitive tasks and creative tasks. Um, so we, we focus on um, empathy, observation, attention, attention skills, all that. So this is one big chunk. And the other big chunk is how to um, in a way, democratize wildlife through technology and to bring it close and personal so that you actually care about this distant wildlife that is so far away from you. And, and through this, to facilitate ecocentrism and hopefully trigger a behavioral change. Because as we know, we only want to save what we, what we love. And in order to fall in love, we need to know. Um, and the biggest challenge for us is to combine your virtual reality experience or your digital experience uh, through, through the kids app with real life activities. So that we, we really aim to create experiences that don't, don't just end where the experience ends, but combined with real life actions. Like for example, that's you, you can also watch live cameras because we've installed three live cameras in Kenya in this conservancy. So potentially you can watch in live streaming cameras the same animals you've just interacted with through virtual reality, but you can also donate to the conservancy, for example. Um, so these are the ecocentrism and um, emotional detox are the big tracks of that we are very passionate about. So two very Sorry. simple topics about. to take on. <laughs> OK, and just so you know, Sam and Melvina are together. They're co-founders of a Phil company. And please tell us about the extraordinary work that you've been up to. 
Uh, so I'm Malvina Martin, and I'm one of the co-founders of Black Dot Films, together with Max. I'll let Max introduce himself. Um, <laughs> Max Solomon. So we founded uh, Black Dot Films VR about a year and a half, two years ago, and we are, we were, and are the launch and content partner for National Geographic. I'll let Max tell the story of how we stumbled upon it, but. Um, Essentially, we do all, just about all of the National Geographic VR 360 uh, pieces. And we do everything from wildlife to uh, you know, natural history to people to conservation mes messages. We did a lot of the um, companion pieces to some of the magazine stories. We are producing, gosh, like 12, uh, 12 VR pieces every year for the Facebook pl platform and Hulu for National Geographic. Um, we also have other other clients out there, Smithsonian and such. So, really, we came from a a traditional long form documentary background with National Geographic and producing a long form doc, and translating that to the um, VR world has been a fun new challenge. <laughs> <It's really exciting. laughs> Not for the faint of heart. Right, Max? Yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, we were talking about this a little bit before, but it's coming from, if you think about film, right, uh, it took them 10 years to figure out editing, which is sort of like the grammar of, 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 of how, you tell, how you do films. Um, I think we're still figuring that out, out in VR. And I think that that, you know, it, it, there's obviously technical, technological challenges, but, you know, this whole frontier of, of how do you tell a story that's more complex than just, you know, an encounter? Or, or a moment, and so we've sort of, you know, we've been, we've been, we've been asked to push at that by our client, which is really great because we, you know, we get to to try to do more complex storytelling and um, talk a little bit more about that. What do you mean? Describe what that tension might be. The encounter isn't it enough that I find myself? They did an experience of, with hammer sharks. Isn't it enough that I find myself in the water, like this close to a hammer shark? What beyond that do you think is important to be thinking about? You know, th th that piece was one of the earlier pieces that we did, and that piece is pretty much about being, being close to an animal like that. But when you start to think about conservation issues and how do you actually impact change and how do you get somebody to really deeply connect at an emotional level um, and understand what the issues are. You know, we did a, we did a film, this one, which was uh, a cover story for National Geographic magazine, which was about uh, orphaned baby orangutans. And, um, you know, one of the things that... that those of us who work in, in creating content, we never get to really see how people inter interact with it. Um, but last Christmas, I put the film in, in headsets on my mother-in-law. And there's a moment in the film where we, we, they get these baby or orangutans that are orphaned. Um, uh, they, they literally have never seen a tree before, right? And they get wheeled into the forest every day to be taught how to climb, how to be an orangutan. And we mounted a camera on the front end of of the, of the wheelbarrow, and of course, their orangutans are like children. They want to touch, they want to lick, they want to, you know, break uh, most of the time. Um, but those, there, there are moments where, you know, for us, that was obviously a, a technical problem to overcome, but those moments ended up becoming these incredibly powerful moments in VR because when, as opposed to a film, when someone looks at you and makes eye contact and reaches out to you, right, which is what that, what that orangutan is doing in, in those moments, um, you connect. My mother-in-law, when she took the headset off, she was in tears, and she, but the next thing she wanted to do was write a check to whomever you know is taking care of these baby orangutans. So you can, and, and 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 because we're, you know, there's also I think this 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 struggle in any sort of storytelling is that is I think is sort of at the core of this conference in some ways is how much entertainment do you do versus how much lecturing do you do. And, and finding that balance, because if you tip it the wrong way, you don't achieve any goals. Well, that's actually a perfect transition to Mia, because we have two <laughs> content creators here as a startup, and then as a production company, and then Mia, you're on both sides of it. You create content, and then you also distribute content, and you're spending a lot of your time and energy taking a look at exactly how people are inter interacting with this with three-dimensional VR, CGI, 360 video material. Tell us about what you're up to over at Time, Inc. Sure, um, so I'm Mia Trams. I'm the managing editor of Life VR, which is Time, Inc.'s uh, company-wide VR and now AR initiative as of this May. Um, and my role, I wear a lot of hats, uh, my role is to develop and produce VR and AR experiences for all of our brands, which include 
Times, Sports Illustrated, uh, People, Entertainment Weekly, Travel and Leisure, Food and Wine, Essence and Style, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and I also lead strategy for the company in both of those technologies and how we enter into those marketplaces. Um, so, you know, we've, we have a wide range of titles that allow us to, uh, you know, develop and distribute content that touches almost every vertical you could imagine. Um, and what I've tried to do, the kind of driving vision for Life VR, which is an extension um, in many ways of the Life Magazine brand, um, has been to take the original mission statement of that magazine, which was to take people to places that they never could uh, access in the world. Uh, and if you read the original mission statement for that magazine, it reads like a VR pitch. It's crazy. <laughs> Henry Luce was like way ahead of the game in 1936. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one driving force to take people places they could never go, which is obviously the thing that VR does. Um, but also, uh, my personal mission was to, even if it's in a small way, with every single project that we create or distribute, uh, I want to be pushing the conversation of what we can do in this medium forward, um, you know, what we can do as storytellers, what we can do um, as, uh, you know, a an, an nascent industry. Um, so I think, you know, some of the projects that we can play in just a second in the real kind of touch on that. Um, very briefly, uh, you know, we've done everything from a recreation of the attack on Pearl Harbor, which is a full room scale game engine run experience where you can interact with every single thing uh, for the 75th anniversary of the attack last year. And, you know, that was, um, the challenge there was making the environment as journalistically uh, accurate as we could because it's a time project, it has the time name on it, and we have to meet a certain uh, user expectation of what people expect from our brand. So the same kind of uh, vetting that we do in any piece of journalism for that brand we did for Remembering Pearl Harbor. And if you're in it, whatever you're looking at is 100% as real as we could get it. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have Capturing Everest, which was a VR four-part docu-series for Sports Illustrated. It's the first bottom to top climb of Mount Everest in VR as a documentary piece. Um, certainly there's, you know, the Everest game for Vive, but this was a, a documentary and um, it was also our first AR execution. So we had the VR series that we distributed, then we had the AR activation off of the front and back covers of that issue of Sports Illustrated. We had an eight page spread in the magazine and then we had a 360 video hub on SI.com. So we're really trying to push the formats, um, push the ways in which, you know, journalism can be told in these different um, types of VR, and uh, we can give you a taste of uh, what we've done in the real.
So you see, this is actually, that was our AR reel. Sorry, forgive me, I thought it was the VR reel. Um, in the AR reel, you can see how the VR experiences launches from an AR experience uh, with Sports Illustrated, and you can also see some of our ad integration, which of course is like a huge question for my part of the industry, maybe other parts of the industry as well. Um, how do we put revenue behind some of the things we're doing? Well, that's a good transition too. I think we're, I'm gonna throw out one question and we can talk about this for a few minutes and then I'm gonna open it up to um, questions. There's really two buckets of issues I think many of the challenges can go in. One is talking about content, content production, which would be hardware and software. And then the and interactivity, how interactive do we want to make that? And the second bucket would be the distribution and the audience. How do we get it to audiences? How do we get people to try it? I would love to hear from each of you, and you can start, follow. what are you most excited about and what do you see as the biggest challenge? And feel free to comment on one another, too, because you have different seats at the table as we move forward And what is, I know we all will agree, and certainly the audience. These are early, 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 early days, right? Yeah. Early. Um, I'm personally most excited about uh, location-based shared experiences. So um, if you go to Madame Tussauds at Times Square, now you can see the Ghostbusters shared experience uh, that was created by The Void. And um, in that, you can do it with like four or five of your friends. You're each wearing basically a computer as a backpack and a headset, and then they give you a proton gun, and then you go into this kind of warehouse size location where the VR world they've created in CGI is mapped to the physical location. So you're walking across swinging bridges that are actually swinging under your feet, you're fighting ghosts together, and you can see each other as avatars in the space because you have sensors on your body. Obviously, this is like a very highly commercialized version of what that could be, but I think that you know, Alejandro Iñárritu actually just um, launched his first kind of documentary film in that style where you're participating in the film uh, as avatars and you can see everybody else you're sharing the experience with. Um, and I think the possibilities there are pretty fascinating and that's, that's the thing I'm most excited about, I think. How many of you have done some VR? Okay, not everyone. Um, <laughs> how many of you have done a lot, like more than 10 experiences? So maybe a third. So do you believe that creating these multi, any of you, and then certainly speak to what you, you know, excited and challenged about, but multi-user, do you see that as potentially game, game changing in terms of encouraging and inspiring audiences to engage with these VR, AR experiences? I, I, there was, there was a, 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 a Early, like we go back a year, you know, VR time seems to go like a double speed in terms of, of history. So like a year ago is like you know, the Stone <laughs> Age. Yeah. Um, but what was really interesting was watching people discover Facebook 360 because they suddenly realized they had something in their pocket that could do something that they didn't understand, right? They could suddenly like, we, we, there was a, well, one of our, our, our first videos was an experience in which you're flying over these erupting volcanoes in Kamchatka and, um, <laughs> Uh, there's a woman in the comment stream, because we always read the comment stream, who is saying, this is the worst camera work I've ever seen. All I see is <laughs> propeller hair, propeller blades, and, you know, and I'm lying in bed, and I put the phone down, and then I'm like, oh my god, there's the volcano. And she like, sits down, and she sits back down in bed, and like, you know, she sees the wheels, of the, and, she's, and, she, and somehow suddenly it clicks for her that she can control the, the point of view. She doesn't know how she's doing it or, how, or, or what, and she, and she shares it with everyone, right? She sends it to everyone she knows, and the thing explodes, right? Um, and I think that those sort of, those questions around accessibility of the technology and, and how people are gonna interact with it, um, I think are kind of at the nexus of how we tell stories as well. Um, so, uh, you know, a radio show and a television show and a play and uh, a VR experience and a film are not the same thing. They don't speak the same language, they all entertain, they all tell the story, but how do you, how, how you, the grammar of it is different. And, it, and, and VR has um, this unique set of rules that we're just discovering, I think, um, and, and figuring out how to, how to recontrol the audience. Because we give up a lot of control, right? We give up control over where the audience looks, where they, in some cases, where they are. Mm -hmm. um, but we still need to, you know, it, ultimately the process of making art, uh, taking a photograph or something like that, is around putting frames around, re, regaining control over it. Does that 
And that's the exciting part. All of those lists of exciting and challenging parts that you've mentioned, but does that, does that only apply to storytellers? Because in your case, right, I mean, it's really about engagement and this interactivity, this exchange. I'm learning by participating in something that I wasn't able to if I was watching just a animal show on yeah, television sure. or in a book. That was the whole point. And, um, it's not storytelling, is it? No, well, I'm Russian, so I'm paranoid, right? <laughs> um, and I was so actually worried that um, what, what our VR experience should look like so that we don't simply replicate or pretend that we're teleporting you, but what other completely new and unique experience we can deliver to you that you can never experience uh, in real life. Because I was very worried of all those comments like, oh, it, it, it's always better to go, uh, to go and experience wildlife in real life. It, you can't compare it to, to an offline e experience. So we, we thought that if, if our VR is all about actually interactivity that is unavailable in any real life situation because you, you can't feed a lion, you can't feed, I mean, you, <laughs> well, you can, <laughs> but probably only once in your lifetime. Um, so we, we really worked hard with, with our um, writer and psychologist what interactivity we could add to to give you a completely new emotional experience. And I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not obsessed with storytelling, and I do believe that abstract paintings are the best. Um, so for us, it was also about how to create emotional experience, not necessarily strictly narrative driven, but how to create this full set of really wonderful emotions you can experience when you interact with with wild creatures when you feed them, when you call them, because we also have sound recognition in the second release. Um, and through this very sweet, wonderful experiences, you, you learn really important things that we want you to learn, that you, can't, that you can't learn only through cognitive experience. It needs to be done through emotional experience. So yeah, that's, that's why we, we are quite obsessed with, with interactivity. And speaking of challenges, I, I need to complain, right? Because I'm Russian. Um, I think, especially for independent producers, it's all about visibility, obviously. Um, that's, I think, the, the only problem. But the, and the big, the big task is to work on retention and engagement, because when you, are, when, when you produce VR not for marketing or PR purposes, you do want your users to go back to your product. And I think retention is the biggest but that's, Question but that's true for both, wouldn't you say, Melvina, as somebody who's producing content? Your clients want people to keep coming back, even if they're distinctive. And Mia, I'd love to hear your two cents on that, and then we'll open it up to folks. But what, what is your thought on that, Melvina? Well, sure. I mean, you're, you're, there's a fine line, I guess, with storytelling, like we do, is are we there to entertain people, or are we there to teach them and tell them a story and tell them about the world? And that's always the fine line we, as content makers and producers, are always trying to cross. Now, I think there's a way of doing it, and it's, you know, we come from many years of working for places like Natural, Natural Geographic, where we kind of hone storytelling skills. And what I see that's most exciting about this business is this rapid evolution in storytelling with all this, with these new tools and this brand new, really exciting way of reaching an audience without having to lecture them. So, for instance, in the old school specials that, you know, you would watch on National Geographic, you would have, you know, a, a, a documentary about wildlife, and you would hear this voice of God narrator telling you, you know, how we're destroying the planet, and these poor creatures are going to die, and guilt, 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 right? They're this voice <laughs> of God narrator telling you how to feel, and, you know, people don't like that. You get turned off. It's, you know, so... We, coming from many, many years of working in documentaries, we've seen this business kind of go, nobody's watching docs anymore because they're lecturing and they're boring. And it was, who wants to sit down and watch a 60 minute documentary about you know, eels, right? Who cares? So I think we found a way of really- Or, or the end of the world, which I think was actually one, that, worse, one of the yes. last ones we worked on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was not very popular. Um, very Doom depressing and dark. But there's a way of putting, now there's this exciting new way of putting your your, your viewer inside the story, you're not lecturing to them. You never use a voice of God narrator because that's just weird. I mean, hearing a narrator in a VR 
experience, you're like, it's creepy. You know, you feel like a, your voice inside speaking to you. You are letting the viewer completely choose where they want to look. I mean, they might turn away from the gruesome scene of the elephant being decapitated. They might, but they're not going to turn the TV off. They're in for the experience, right? So you're really empowering the viewer to experience something and let them come away with an entirely different experience than if you watched it or if you watched it. So it's really changing, completely revolutionizing, I think, the way we tell stories and raising all these really interesting questions of, you know, is it, do we control what the audience looks at or do we give them total control? I mean, is that, is that true? I mean, from all the data you guys collect, is that what I want as a user? Do I really enjoy having this autonomy and this ability, this agency, this ability to make choices or decisions in the experiences of it? Well, I think that the answer to that question is very different for 360 video experiences versus game engine run experiences. If it's a game engine run, yes, you want a lot of choices. You want to have the choices you can make be very clear. Um, you shouldn't have to be confused about like, uh, can I go over here? What happens if I do this? Like, is this off limits or not? You should feel like you have the freedom to explore and that you're discovering things while also sort of being guided. I think in 360 video, you, you know, for the kinds of stories that we're trying to tell, you do want to feel as though you are within a narrative arc. Um, and I think that, you know, as we were talking about before, there are tools for you to guide the experience while giving you a, a degree of freedom. You know, you can uh, draw attention with sound if you have um, spatial audio. Uh, you know, certainly there's visual cues you can give people to make sure that they're engaging with the right part of the sphere or that like their discovery of a part of a sphere becomes a part of their experience of the storytelling. So, you know, yes, in a way it is like you're giving up control, but in the other ways that we have control in all other mediums, we're developing the tools to be able to really give you a guided experience that still feels exploratory. Um, but, you know, I don't think that, one of the things that people always pitched when I started working on this in, within our brands was, oh, it's like choose your own adventure. And I was like, no, people actually don't <laughs> want that. If you think about like when you're sitting at home, you have your TV time and you're gonna you know, have an hour to two hours to just relax, you don't want to be like, oh, if I go down this way, what happens? Or if I, it's like, it's, I don't think that people actually want that experience with 360 video at least. Um, but you know, I think for us, a big part of it too was thinking about what are these brands that have such a storied legacy in VR and what are people expecting out of those brands when they come to a Time or a Sports Illustrated or uh, even like an EW experience. Um, and that's something that you know, I've played around with a lot. I think that bringing, we brought a lot of our experiences to museums. Um, we created a VR hologram of Buzz Aldrin last year and uh, he takes you from his landing site. The astronaut. On the, the astronaut, yeah. yes, the astronaut Buzz Aldrin. He takes you from his landing site on the moon to the surface of Mars and then kind of talks through this idea he has about how humans could colonize the planet. And it's a game engine run experience that runs off of Unity. Um, you can, it's volumetric, you can completely walk around in it. Um, and we took it to the Air and Space Museum. And I think that intersection of what you thought time was, because that was a time project, uh, with this new technology and experiencing it in that space in a context that adds even more value to the experience that you're watching, that's super interesting to me. And that sort of audience engagement is what I'm kind of most interested in pursuing. Okay, I'm interested in some audience engagement right here, right now. Um, <laughs> does anyone have some questions? And as you make your way to the mic, I'm just going to make one quick comment, which is you guys all talked about things that were exciting and engaging. I'm going to bitch for a minute, which is I'm working on a project myself, as they've heard me bemoaning. And we really t are in, in incredible need of pre-production tools and as a way of envisioning what these stories are. For you gamers, you already know that you go into CGI and you have this ability, or in Unity rather, in Unreal to create worlds that you want. You know, for those of us who are working on the sort of storytelling side and you're doing a lot of 360 video, I mean, we're far more limited. And so envisioning how that might look in a three-dimensional world, there just aren't tools out there. So I, if anybody's thinking about starting a company, I would definitely give my vote to you on that. Anyway, please tell us your name and then ask us a question.
I'm always, when I'm underwater in World of Warcraft, I hold my breath. <laughs> when I watch Jacques Cousteau on the television, I don't. When I have an underwater experience with a VR headset on, I don't. Now, I can suspend reality. I'm a, a very a master at it. However, what I'm waiting for, and I, I, see, I hear little hints that, you know, here and there, you with the, um, saying the, aud the auditory and the, um, you know, the, the aromas that you're introducing to add, you know, another layer to the physical response system and what have you. But what I want to know is, when is it going to be a situation where I, as the user, truly impact the environment? Not just experience it here, there, uh, maybe I'll go there, maybe I'll go there, but impact it. Is that coming? Do you see the need for it? It's magic a magic leap. All, all VR is kind of a magic trick, right? I mean, it, it, there's an illusion. I'm, wait, I'm waiting for the oasis, you know? Well, but, but, I, but I mean, like, you know, 360 video was the first time that we gave you the illusion of freedom inside of a film to control something, right? I'm sorry? Uh, in 360 video, it was the first time that we gave you the illusion of being able to control the situation. There's a lot of stuff that people think they're actually influencing the, the, the even, in, even in a video game, even in a room scale situation, you think you're influencing what's, what's happening around you, or even in a film, sometimes a recorded experience, people have that, that notion that somebody looked at me. Like, you know, we all sit on the subway and somebody happens to look up and we think that person knew I was looking at them, they looked at me. We have those same things in VR, so it's a matter of, of upscaling that component of our right. storytelling. Right. Um, I think we're, you know, components of it, sort of, like, like the choose your own adventure, um, can play into that. Uh, I think you have to do it well, right? There's nothing, there's nothing worse for an audience, it's to, sort of to your, to your point, than work, letting some of the audience that. go too far and get lost, right? Like suddenly they, they literally wander around and the, you give them freedom to wander around the palace of Versailles and they end up in a broom closet, right? They, they haven't seen Versailles. Um, so you, there's, a, there's a point to guiding and, and controlling the, the narrative to some extent. But the, the real magic to it is to give them the illusion that they have freedom of choice inside the experience and still funnel them to where the most spectacular moments and the arc that, you know, that we were talking about, you know, we want to be entertained. We want a beginning, middle, and an end. We don't just want to be flying endlessly over, over, over glaciers in Iceland, which is a lot of early VR, right? The sort of here, you know, sort of security camera footage. You want a journey. And I think we'd all agree, just to your uh, question, and then we can move on to the next question, it's also a que of where we are with the technology. The technology is not okay. quite That's there, I right? I mean, the actual software, the, the headsets, I mean, we need, there's, there are improvements that are happening and that are coming, even some by the end of this year, that are gonna be far better than even, say, I would a, even say it's, a year ago. It's more about the, the business than it is about the technology, because, like, you know, for example, uh, Remembering Pearl Harbor is a room scale piece that we created with an outside production house named Deluxe. And uh, it runs about 15 minutes long. There's three different locations. I'm not gonna say exactly how much that cost, but it was in the hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. That's not a budget that a company like mine can gotcha. support. You know, we did outside fundraising to fund the production of that. And the realism only goes as far as the money would take us. So until there is a robust business behind VR where the, the money coming in supports the budgets that would support the kind of experience that you're talking about or unless somebody wants to, you know, of course, like on the front end, invest a few million dollars to get the kind of interactivity you're looking for, it just, it's, there's a limiting factor of how much money is available to produce these things. But this is, is the is part it, where we all like hit our head up against well, it's, the it's, floor it's, it's, because it's like the chicken and the egg. It's like who's gonna spend that right, money to do the right, R&D right. that's needed in order to create a product that then we see will engage audiences. I mean, it's like this round and round and round and round and well, round. I, but I mean, Oculus and Facebook happened, right? And three okay, well then happened. quickly and, and, and let me just throw one other thing yeah. at you. Have you determined I if actually, there's a personality I, type that is more attuned to the suspension of reality? And I'm finished now, thank you. Ooh, that's it. Uh, Any psychologists in the room? <laughs> but, but just, just sort of to what you were raising, it, 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 and, and you know, it, it's true hey, also for us in, yeah, yeah, go ahead, in, so we in, can get in terms of, in terms of for us, the biggest, the biggest challenge as well is, is, is the funding of, the, of these projects. They're incredibly expensive to do. A 90 second film that takes you to 
um, to someplace that National Geographic's brand takes you is incredibly expensive because you still have to go there, right? Um, and that's so, the best part. But that's the best part for us. That's why we love doing these things. But at the end of the day, it's incredibly expensive. And so a mass audience matters. Um, the number of times that we've had conversations about pie in the sky ideas, not, not to diminish them, they're fantastic. Right. I mean, we dream, we have the yeah. same dreams that you do, right? The problem is getting our clients to sign off on them financially. We need some um, money to follow you know, we, 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 the, the places where we can liberate yeah. funds are, are tied to their big initiatives. Um, and, you know, uh, but, but it is incredibly, in, as an economic model, that, you, you know, you, you do need to. There are some real challenges there. I see yeah. somebody with the mic. Hi, my name is Christopher Reichert. I've come down from Boston from the uh, Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. We're, we're debating how to incorporate uh, augmented reality and virtual reality into our uh, institute, which where we teach about the U.S. Senate, but one of the things we have is, as an asset is the, uh, the Kennedy compound. And so there was two questions. I had the, the opportunity to experience the Remembering Pearl Harbor at the museum last November. Oh, great. Yeah. And I was, and I think it was Malvina, was it you said that there's, you were avoiding the voice of God, you know, as a, in the experience because it's disorienting. So for me, I'm, from my mind, and you know, this is something that I'm debating uh, internally, but also with, with uh, colleagues and friends is, you know, the uh, IMAS experience was kind of like the immersive experience of, you know, 10, 20 years ago, even now. But I see this virtual reality as replacing that. And then from a movie making and a storytelling perspective, you know, whether you're, if you're watching a movie, you're being told a story, right? So in, in essence, the actors are the voice of God in that, in that sense, right? So, you know, in the remembering Pearl Harbor, there was some narrative, but then there was quiet where, I guess when you entered a scene, you had narrative, but then it left you to your own devices. So I'm trying to figure out where, if you see this going into long form, to our movies uh, as, as a kind of a replacement for IMAX, or more in the 15 minute uh, taking you to distant horizons area, if you see how that might transition. Well, that's a great question. If one of you want to answer that, because I know that there were some other questions and we have exactly seven minutes and 57 seconds. So who wants to take that on? Is there a movie, are there movies in VR to be made? What about AR? When, when we move into the AR, it will be endless, because it will be our new reality, actually, right? Then you don't have to worry whether it's short form or long form. It's your life, your new layer in, in life. Speaking of augmented reality, for example. I think virtual reality, I think the longest piece that we have done is a nine minute piece. It was the baby orangutans in the wheelbarrow picture you saw. And that was really pushing it, I think, for the technology that we have now. Um, I think people just, there's gonna be a growing getting acquainted, getting accustomed to watching something in full immersion like that. And the only way really to tell a long piece, like a nine minute or a 20 minute, is to have a story. So back to your earlier point of voice of God narrator, that doesn't work for VR because it's discombobulated. You don't know where that voice is coming from and it's kind of creepy for that reason. Uh, what we discovered along the way was you want to follow along with somebody. It's almost like you're, you're doing a buddy film and you're with your buddy and you see your buddy, you're standing right next to him and he, this is what we learned, the real trick is you want that buddy in the VR world to look you in the eye. It's something you never do in television because you're sitting in your living room and it was a big no-no, you never film an interview and have them look at the camera because it's disconcerting, right? If you're watching a VR piece and you're following a character through the piece and they're telling you or they're talking to you like walking through nature and telling you what's going on, if they don't turn around and acknowledge you or even just wink at you or it's like creepy. the baby orangutans, reach out and touch that lens, it's very creepy. You feel like you're a voyeur It's sort of a ghost space. effect, right? You, you yeah. don't, you, in VR, you're actually in the scene. And if you're not acknowledged, imagine if you're going through daily life and you're transparent, you, in the, the invisible man, you, you know, uh, it's a weird thing. But it's also, this gets in a little bit into the grammar thing that we were talking about before, it's one of the ways that we manipulate the audience. We're social animals. We look where other people are looking, right? right? It's, it's the way that, back to magic tricks, you know, the magician has a beautiful assistant to make sure that you don't see what he's doing over here. We can, we can draw your attention around. I mean, we're not, you know, in 360, yes, we give up control, but we are actually controlling. If you're doing it well, you're controlling 
where the audience is looking. We, we, we look at where our edits are and we can predict, because we get a lot of feedback in terms of heat maps and such where people are looking, and most of the time we're right about where people are looking at the end of a shot before the next shot goes, and those, those key moments, we, we know that we can funnel them back in. Yeah, and it's and I think to your which to are all your, keys to, to getting just, the story to go longer, getting more towards its complex narrative well, and cinema. Moments. Yeah, the underlying idea is there are social mores. If you're in a classroom, kids often don't want to be sitting in the front row. When they're in VR, even when you're told they're invisible, they don't want to be in the front row. And that was proved. It's a wonderful story, of VR step storytelling guide by Katie Newton and um, Kareen uh, Sukop, who. It's a medium post, and they, they break down you, how interesting it is about what the expectation is of the user devoid of the technology itself, that we tend to fall back into roles as we uh, behave in the real world. I saw there was a mic. I was also just going to oh, well, sure. uh, yeah, go just briefly say, you know, I think um, our guiding principle for length of content has been let the story dictate how long it should be. Um, so we've certainly had pieces that are three to five minutes in length. Um, remembering Pearl Harbor can run anywhere from, I mean, you could stay in it as long as you want, but it tends, people tend to spend about 15 plus minutes in it. Um, and then, you know, Capturing Everest is a four part series that totals 40 minutes of content. Um, there's definitely people starting to experiment with feature length um, pieces. And, you know, I think when you get into the game engine run experiences, it really, at a certain point, becomes determined by the user. So I, I look at the story and how much it merits, uh, how much time the story itself merits as kind of the guiding principle for how long the piece should be. One sort of moment on length, just sort of a funny story. There was a, a we got a call about a month or two oh, ago. It was one of the most, was, we love crazy ideas. Sorry. This is um, crazy. We love crazy ideas. We got a call from an advertising agency in Amsterdam. They were working with a major airline who was trying to promote flying to China, to, yeah. And they wanted Amsterdam to do to China, to a, a, like, an, like, a, like, a, like an ad campaign, ticket to, to, to Beijing, zero dollars, book now. You book it, and essentially it's a, a three-day VR, live three-day long VR film um, on which you have the full experience of being the passenger flying to China, checking like in. checking your like any point that you would come in into the experience, you'd, you'd, you'd be asleep. Somebody would be giving real, you food, real life, real time, time, time. scale, not edited. A, a, Eight a, hours literally of sleep. a live three hour, three day trip to China, and and the the sort of you know our heads exploded because <laughs> technologically, how are you going to the data? You know, where do you store all that data? How do you push it out? How do you how do you play it back? How do you you know and how do you record it first of all? Um, and the amount of gigabytes that we're talking uh, about. What but it, for? but it, you know, in terms of thinking about where, where can we go, I mean, there's no reason you couldn't do that down the road. It's, there's a technological barrier, of course. Um, the question also is, is that you know, if you're trying to promote a, chap, a tourism destination is an unedited experience, the one you want to have. Um, <laughs> did, you take, did you take the gig? I mean, are you? Well, uh, the the, 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 the really budget was not in line with yeah. the cost. With the ambition, <laughs> sure. With the ambition, does anybody have a very quick um, question? If not, I'm just going to ask the panel to give us some final thoughts on what we, what would they advise us to be looking out for relative to this idea of you know virtual reality experiences and interactivity and so on. Should we do that? Okay, sure. You guys want to go right down the row? We have a minute and 35 seconds. I feel like this, th there's this red clock right in front of me, and I feel like someone's going to come out and get me if I don't yeah. like go finish back. right on time. All right, so go ahead. Me. Okay. Yes. So, Alanta, we'll just go right down. Uh, just whatever your last thought is My on this. Thought. Like, what, give us some thoughts on things we might want to be thinking about um, moving forward. Um, speaking of this three day experience, I think still the question is that we need to ask all the time why, like, why yeah. the hell it should be in VR or AR? What does it give? What added value do you actually get? Because the feature films is a wonderful format. Literature is a wonderful format. I mean, painting, sculpture. So, and, and VR is, is a different format. So um, how is it different? What artistic devices can you use? What is unique to VR? And please keep in mind that our brain has a, has a wonderful ability to fill in the gaps, right? We don't, we don't need to see the whole of the tree to know that it's a tree. So why do we need the whole of the tree in 360, right? So there are lots of issues that have to do with our 
brain, neuroscience, aesthetics, and it's art. Make it beautiful and good quality. <laughs> And, and dream big. I mean, we just said this three-day excursion to China was a crazy idea, but there are no crazy ideas. I mean, we're really at the front end of this brand new technology. And you know, what we're finding is a lot of companies out there that are VR production companies, they start off with a piece of tech, a camera. And that's all they have is this piece of camera. But really, it's about storytelling. It's about coming up with the ideas. And then you can jerry-rig anything to tell that story. You know, it, it, don't don't let that diminish, you know, your dreams of how to envision something beautiful. Tell. Yeah, one of the we, there was a, the, sort of the technology dictates what you can do with it, right? If you have a VR camera that you know can't actually be taken outside, you're not going to be able to tell stories that are in the real world. And I think that's sort of a, a, a big one for us is we find the story that we want to tell in in, in VR. There was one of the first pieces we did. Um, I, you know, we, we were just coming up with what the pipeline would be for National Geographic's launch of this, and we said, what if we took people out onto the wing of a biplane with a woman flying in the sky as she walks around on the wings? There's like, you know, 10 people in the country that still do this crazy thing. Um, but there wasn't a camera that could withstand the wind, the power, the G-forces, all of these things, and so we built it, right? But it was about coming back at from, a, from, the, from, from, the other, from the other side of it um, and figuring out a way to do it. I think that there's, you know, um, so it is, it is a really interesting um, medium in the, in the sense that it demands in a way that you innovate. Because we, we're not making films today that we made a year ago, right? They're not the same. They're not, we're not using the same language, we're not using the same techniques. The current one that we're working on, um, we can kind of talk about a little bit, but is, is um, uh, taking you inside the memories of people that were inside of an attack in Iraq and their post-traumatic stress disorder. So, the, the, and their memories are completely fragmented and it's not a literal experience, but you're hearing their voice and you're experiencing, and that's something we haven't done before. I, like, going into that project, I didn't know how we would do it. I still don't know how we would do it. <laughs> I still don't know. Right? But we're still trying to figure this out. And, and that's, and, but that's the exciting part about All VR. Right, so if you like us. those kinds of challenges, yeah. it's a medium for you. If you, if you, and, and you like taking them on, right? It's, right go after something that you don't know how to do, that, that's what's exciting. Mia, you want to close this out for us? Sure. Um, so I think one of the things that I've said a lot, and I'll say it again, <laughs> is um, certainly there is a lot of talk about how uh, VR can be used to engender empathy. And you know, I think that's, we've all talked about that. We've talked about it till we're blue in the face. It's done, and people are doing it well. Um, but I think you know, what gets lost in that conversation is all of the other things that VR does, because it does everything that any other medium can do. And if you're considering creating a project, think about ways to delight viewers. Think about ways to like open up things that they wanted VR to do. It has this amazing promise to like take you to these fantastical worlds, uh, times of history that you could never physically travel to. You can have magic at your fingertips. You know, there's such delightful uh, kind of magical things that it can do, and there's certainly uh, examples of that. But I think it's you know something that gets lost at least within like our industry in the shuffle a bit. Um, just delight people, and I think that that sort of user experience uh, is a great road to engendering audience uh, as much as you know an empathic one would be. Okay, you guys, don't kill me. Just one last thing. Like, what are your best sources? I personally like the NYT VR app. I find it really easy to use, and you don't necessarily have to have a headset to take a look at and experience. Do you just want to go down quickly, like, what your favorite? Obviously, Very app is great, but what's your go-to if you want to, like, experience? Are there any other apps? There are other. There are, yeah. no, no, I'm waiting for Okay, Magic they're going to kill me. All right. Okay. Waiting for Magic Leap. Yes. I yeah. As we walk out, you can tell I, the I, audience. I, I, Thank I, you. I, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, audiences want to hear new, new things. They, they really want, to your point, they want a new experience. They want a new yeah. experience. They want a new experience. They want what, they haven't, what they've done before.